Uh, we have informal regular session here, uh, the 27th of May, and we have two items on the agenda, apiary uh, update from Jeff Harris and Workforce Investment Board update from Adam Jones. So Jeff's up first, and we have the slides up. So Jeff. Right. Uh, first of all, let me tell you, this was actually a ripoff of one of my lectures, the slides that I have here today. Okay. okay. Well, that's you, good. Better than bringing a live colony in the uh, yes. building. I thought you might appreciate the slides better. Oh, I like uh, the yes. lights. Oh, that's been kind of cool. Yeah, well, I know you'd like it. <laughs> uh, so, I've been, so apiary is honeybees. That's correct, and I am an apiologist. There we go. Uh, on that term, okay. Uh, I've been working in your county for 12 years now. Um, and um, initially when I came on, there was about 65 registered beekeepers in your county. Um, a couple years after that, I it helped them increase to about 130, 135, which were sustaining and have been sustaining for about 10 years now. Um, a new tropical species moved in, lucky me, lucky you, uh, about four or five years ago. It's a small hive beetle. Uh, it's normally a uh, equatorial species. Well, we have it here and it's staying here now. And uh, it's my last nemesis, as I know right now. There was a, a mite, I don't know if you're, you're aware of the, the Varroa mite, I think everybody probably in here knows of that mite. And we've learned to live with that, and so have the bees. Uh, it takes its toll on the colonies, but this small hive beetle is a nasty, nasty animal. And so that's our, our new thing for sustainability. So uh, how do you try to eradicate that? Well, you have to do it mechanically. You actually use a mechanical vial trap. They're like little tanks. The bees can't do anything with these pests. They simply just chase them around the colony, and until they find this trap, the, ant, the uh, pest, and falls into it, and then it drowns in the mineral oil, it's in this vial-type containment. Um, you can have it on your hive, 365. It doesn't affect the food product or the bees in any way, um, and that's a good thing because so a lot most of, our, of the hives have those now installed. I suggest it, and usually I will suggest it when I get a positive hit or a question of the area of how strong they are in the area. Okay. Okay. Um, the Varroa mite uh, is handled through uh, some chemical treatments. Some of them are organic, not so hard on the bees. Again, on a, slow, on a small amount of infestation, it can be controlled, but it goes so far and then you're going to be wiped out. And then you're raising something that's not bees. What, what happens at that point, I don't know. So that chemical and those products can only be on the hive when it's not a food product on the colony for you and I, uh, legitimately. So I have this year found three samples that I sent to a laboratory, which is unusual because usually I don't take comb samples, but maybe once a year in an entire county. And I've, I'm, I'm a little concerned because I've sent three in already this year, and I've only been working uh, south of here for some weeks. So I'm hoping that's going to end somehow. I'm waiting for the lab results on that to find out actually what it is and what they think before I jump to conclusions. Hopefully it's not a real threat. It's handleable. Um, but one of them was an import uh, that, that was hauled in. So they were selling bees and that's a whole nother line for me to follow is where that came from. You know, That's the problem with hauling. Like the small hive beetle, it can only go about a mile or so a year, well, man drives 65 miles an hour, so you can't use that, you know, reference to, because otherwise we would have never seen them in this area. You would, you know, they just came up here with the trucking, right? Like a lot of things. And you, so know, you know that in this community. The beehive came on a truck and the beetle came with them. Yeah. You know that in this community, uh, like with Longhorn. Your, your, your trees and stuff. Right. Same thing. It was hauled in, right? Yeah. Yeah, this, this. This beautiful county's taken a big hit in a few years here environmentally. Um, the upside of that is, with your tree losses, it may produce a lot of wild foraging areas for pollinators, which have a real problem right now. Um, we've lost 90% of our honeybees since uh, about 45 or so. And um, that's not, we're not gonna recover from that. We're gonna maintain the 10% level that we've had and so that leaves us with about 5,000 beekeepers and about 40,000 colonies in the state. We have about 100 to 120 beekeepers in this county, 
and that'll range from oh, 350 to 500 counties or uh, colonies of what you have in this county. We used to have a commercial beekeeper here down by the river. He had about 600 colonies, and he was one of these pollinators that trucked them around the country out to the almond fields and, and things like that. And he was basically, in business uh, terms, starving to death down here because the lack of precipitation is what he claimed. So they moved above I-70 in the state of Ohio. So there's no real commercial outfits. Uh, and what I mean by that is 10 colonies and under, or a hobbyist type bee yard. But that being said, 80% of all our bee stock, including feral or commercial, is supported by basic hobbyist level beekeepers, one to three colonies, is 80% of all our bee stock. And that's why my role, I believe, has changed. Instead of just doing slam dunk, pe slam dunk pest and disease inspections, it's now sustainability and education and tutorials at the colonies so they can sustain. Because I, I can tell them the pests and diseases and leave, and next year nobody has bees. And uh, it's, not a, it's not an easy game, bees. It used to be. When all the farms had bees, and we had a lot of these pests and diseases that weren't here, if you put a colony on a farm, it was always there. You could always count on getting honey from it. Those days are long gone. Yeah, that's not going to come back. Jeff, over the last year in Claremont County, was it 40% was it of the, uh, the hives collapsed? Well, yeah, it was a pretty strong collapse. We had two real harsh winters, real-time winters. This past one actually was harder than the winter prior to this winter. And so I'm seeing a lot of seasoned and veteran people and colonies perish uh, this year. So I don't have a real grasp on that because I've only been in the field for a couple of weeks now and a lot of rain slowed me down. But, you know, I see it and I have to encourage them to hang in there and what they do have, you know, celebrate and try to regroup and, and just stay with the program because, again, I, I can't have hobbyist quitters and still have bees in this, in this state. It's, you know, it's not going to work. The, the main thing was is we have a pesticide pro problem in the area the whole state where everybody wants green grass and they live in this community and, and on and on. Well, I understand that, but I think we're really hurting the pollinators because we lost 90% of our monarchs in the last couple of years. Now there's a new monarch grant program federal. We have some milkweed seed sitting on there, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, a, that's a great plant for those, yeah. Um, so there's different programs. The federal government's getting involved a little bit where they're having support for the bees, they're having support for the pollinators. Um, but it's a real tipping point, but it has been for some time. It's just like those harsh winters, though, really give a one-two punch to the, uh, the bees. But I see your, this county will rebound. We'll get back into uh, 120, 130 beekeepers and have the numbers that we need here. It, it has for some time now, you know. So people are receptive, you know, and it's working. And a lot of, there's a lot of truck farmers in your county here. And they rely directly on the honeybee. You will not have buying crops, et cetera, without honeybees. Um, I have a list of farms here that all rely on that. And even if they don't have the skill set to have the bees, we have a conversation where they can bring someone in to manage the bees for them at their, at their farm or location, right? So I help them coordinate with that with some people around here. Because there is some doggone good beekeepers around this area. It really is. Bethel, Batavia, yeah. So uh, that helps when I'm not around, uh -huh. right? Helps them keep going because I, I can't be there to answer and, and support them every day. We think we have, uh, Mr. Ubel, I believe, has bees. Do you have bees? Yeah. He does. I can tell that Jeff. One, one of three of us. <laughs> well, right now. Yeah, right now. <laughs> but when you have a lot of these one and two and three hive farms or hobbyists, um, you spend so much time on education. I mean, obviously, you go to a Ronnie Alsup up in Bethel. Which needs no education. You're going through all of his highs, just ch checking stuff out. But for me, it's like, you know, I have 100 questions when you come over. And so you're really an educator is what you are. Right. The old days of me just filling a form out and doing pest and disease management and moving on, you wouldn't even see me. Those are, those are behind us. And I spend time up front with folks like Dave, smart enough to grasp it and carry it on themselves, and then it's less time for me down the road. Now, what he mentioned, uh, a, a fellow out of Bethel, who is one of the best beekeepers I've met in 30 years, he actually has the answers. 
And so he got a 40% hit as well this year as well, so he's worried about recouping. But he's a great fellow in the community to help support that, you know. And he does. He does. You know, but like with David and his project, I don't have to help him forever, just a little bit here and there down the road, you know. So uh, that all being said, said I don't have much more unless you have questions, and I can just run through this. Well, one question I ask you every time. Yes, sir. Um, I don't have any honey. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, sorry. That one. I'm sorry, Bob. Killer bees. Yes, we have them, and they have been in your county. Mm -hmm. We had them in New Richmond last year and the year before, imported. Yeah, but they're like the pit bull, you know, where people want to be like a little bit in denial. There's DNA there, but it's not 100%. So they get in denial over it. Well, I'm into the behavior of the bee, and I can tell. And there's also a lab that can identify these things. But normally, uh, bees are as docile as a, a Labrador. I work just like this in, with bees. Mm. I, I work at Dave's just like this with bees. I don't put any 90-something percent of the time. I don't need any equipment at all. Now, Ronnie's, you start banging around 100 colonies, go ahead and get your stuff on, because somebody's not going to be happy in that group, and it just gets worse. They have these pheromones they release that alert the other bees, and so you gather the problem as you work on them. But normally, they don't want to sting you. You know, these last couple of bad weather days, don't mess with them. You know, today may not be a good bee day, you know. But um, usually, if it, I have them around the corner of my barn, and nobody even knows I have bees, unless I take them to the beehive, you know, because they're not attack animals. You know, that's a, that's a falsehood. Quick story, and then we can move on. But a couple of weeks ago, I bought this small colony because I had lost one of my two hives over the winter, and they call these nuclear hives. You know, basically, you bring it in, transplant it into your own mm -hmm. your own box, but I think Jeff was coming up with how many, 10, 20 of them? How many did you have in your car? Uh, probably about a dozen. He had a, a dozen of them. He drove up from Kentucky. Station wagon. And the whole inside of the station wagon, the bees were everywhere. And he <laughs> drove up all the way with his headgear on and his, <coughs> his suit and everything. When you open up the door, these bees were just like, <laughs> like The woman you were with, she was a little freaked Nobody out by that it. Day. Yeah. yeah. Nobody got stung. Yeah. yeah. It was a strange strange sight <laughs> don't let them know you're scared <laughs> you know they can sense that i guess when you when you showed up my dogs actually left you know it's like, we're not gonna be around here very long <laughs> yeah uh, colleen's still talking about that story yeah. <laughs> do you see many wild swarms anymore you know the, the shame about that uh bob is that th we are only down to about three percent or four percent feral bees mm -hmm. and a layman would think it should be 30 or 40 percent feral bees, which it should, it should be. But they're not there. And that's why I take it personal on these small bee yards that they understand what they're really doing, the value of what they're doing here for the community. You know, uh, because the big guys are going to get it. They got a lot of money out. Ronnie's got tons of money out. Anybody with 100 colonies, that's tens of thousands of dollars easy, you know, in all the management hours. The small yard is what's going to keep the bees going. And every once in a while, you know, they swarm. You, you've heard of that, where they release and go into the... And I always think that's a good thing, to re-release back into the wild, you know, and keep the stock going, you know. Our forefathers were terrible beekeepers. When they landed on... The colonists came on shore, they knew they had to bring bees with them, so they brought bees with them. Well, none of the yards lasted, and they all went feral. And that's how we ended up with the bee, the, the honeybee being wild in this country, was they got loose from the first bee yards and they failed. But they knew the value of them coming over from England and so forth, that they had to have them for the apples and et cetera. Mm -hmm. You know? So it's, it's a big deal. It is. Huh. Yeah. So I know, it's just like, um, you know, we have several big orchards. Yeah, there's a lot less now than it used to be, of yeah, course. But they really relied. Right. And usually that was an outside source. Right. They didn't do bees, they did apples. So they would contact an apiarist, would come in. Uh, I'll give you an example, Rousters. That's who I'm thinking. Uh, they've got 10 on one side of the road and like 10 on the other side of the road. And they don't even really do the apples, I don't believe in. No, they don't. They do the blueberries. Right. They still have the colonies back there and the apple trees are still there. So they've gotten rid of all that too. 
Does it blueberry? I heard something. Out of farming completely, and they've uh, pulled all their old stock of the blueberries and, and, plants and everything. Last summer, they had, oh, I know they had a one weekend come pick. Right. On blueberries. Yeah, between where I live, which is close to Wilmington, mm -hmm. and the Ohio River here, there was probably 30 apple orchards. And I bet you there's maybe three. <coughs> you know, I mean, they're just, it's not a lucrative business, I guess, anymore. And, you know, how it is with generational farmers, mm -hmm. one generation doesn't want to do it, you know, and then things get sold, you know. But I think mainly for your community, the importance of the honeybee and the symbiosis of the, the farms is your truck farmers. You know, the mom and pop shops are really supported by the bees. And they don't all, they're not all great beekeepers. So eventually they find out, I don't, I don't do this very well. Better get somebody in here that does. And they generally do because they, they know that they have to have that to make a buck at the food market. You know? So what did you bring us today? I brought you some slides just to give you an understanding of... Uh, not necessarily, it's not of my inspections, just some slides I had from a, uh, I did a, a lecture at Caesar Creek State Park uh, for their bio blitz and I just <coughs> put some pictures together. So I'll just okay. run through these real quick. Uh, those are my colonies, I'm a hobbyist. That's my summer colonies. Yeah, Dave, you'll get so there. Does that, how David, many you'll colonies get there. would I count there? Uh, that's Hours, do I count as a colony? Uh, each one's a hive. Okay. And uh, that's kind of a bragging right right there. Uh, um, Mr. Humphrey, because there's a whole there's there's two thousand pounds of honey right there. Okay. Okay. So each column is a hive. Correct, and each each hive has its own personality, like human beings. You okay. You only have one queen per. Right. Per hive. Tower. Right. This is this is last year's. That's uh, my new victim. That's my granddaughter. <laughs> she was about nine. That was her first year. She didn't get stung that day. You can see all the equipment she had on. And uh, we took her to small ones. Little anatomy there. Um, just so you know, there's three types of casts in the colony. Uh, the drone, in, uh, ma being a male, has no job at all. Imagine that. Yeah, once you fertilize the queen, the show's over, and they exit you to the door around Thanksgiving, right before the, the meal set. They take they take you out there, and that's generally what I'm looking at. And so you reach down that mess and find pests and diseases. Um, not as bad as it looks, they actually behave. Um, this is their navigational abilities, uh, more or less. Uh, so same, same there, and here's some photos of them actually pollinating early season, uh, which is important because the crocus come up with the snow. So that's like one of the first crops. That willows and maples are extremely important. Uh, right out of winter because they bloom like the ground's still frozen. Okay. And this is a swarm. You've seen those? Everybody seen, have everybody seen those before? Yeah. You can actually reach your hand right in the middle of that. They will not sting you. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Except I give off this, I'm afraid, and then they... <laughs> but we, we call that bee bait. We call that bee bait and we send you ahead uh, and, then, yeah. and then we can do the bee bait. Yeah. Yeah. You could put your. And a friend of mine sent me this one. I think it was Valentine's Day. I'm guessing. He loves bees. Get it? Heart. Yeah, yeah. And that's about the normal size of a swarm, uh, about like that. And then they're wintering. They're, they overwinter, and you can see how they downsize once you pull the honey off. Why, why do they swarm? What's is there a purpose? It's their way of repropagating the earth, uh -huh, like you having a child. The same, same thing. It's a clone. Mm -hmm. And the original queen in the colony, the, the uh, fertile queen, leaves with the swarm and then tries to find a good home. And then they get a new queen, which has to be uh, mated with a drone, and that's, that's the end of that process. Um, like I mean, my grandparents would, would go back in the woods, and they'd find a swarm, and you just, you know, just get this big board and get the queen on there, and the swarm just gathered around the queen, and they went and transferred it over to the hives. Sometimes it's easy. Yeah. Sometimes you gotta get the suit and the gloves. Mm -hmm. um, I was supposed to get some out of the tree yesterday, and when that tornado kind of just missed my place and went to Dayton or whatever it was that went up there. The Beaver Creek. Uh -huh. A friend of mine said, I'm in the tree. Can you assist me? I'm like, no, not today, you know. <laughs> but I get calls for swarms daily. But the difference is I'm getting calls from out of the state even. When I was younger, I could catch five swarms a day with a friend of mine every day in the month of May. I won't get five in a whole year now. Wow. Yeah, the, the numbers are very low comparative. I mean, we're doing okay, but 
we're scraping the bottom as far as that. And that's, there's your honey jar right there. Mm -hmm. And that's about it right there. Just wanted to give you some pictures in the yard. Okay. Any other questions, sir? I mean, people have to realize, you know, absolutely we cannot live without bees. No, you can't. I no. No. Th it's been said that if you look out your window, two-thirds of everything you see will be gone in a short period of time without honeybees. Because they think they're very, they are very crop-specific, but they're pollinating everything. And people don't know it, the trees flower, you know, because they're not a real beautiful, large flower. They Sometimes they're small and green. You don't see them. Right now, catalpa's blooming. I don't know if you saw that. The locust just finished down here. And the honey locust is great. Yours didn't get washed out down here. Mine did. So we didn't have that, that flow. But now the catalpa, I just saw it on the way down. And hopefully that will help them as well, you know. Those things are really important. It's not... The fruit trees, actually, everybody thinks, okay, that's where the nectar comes from. Well, actually, they produce very little nectar. And if it wasn't for our dandelion, which is not indigenous, and our clover, which is not indigenous, wasn't there, we probably wouldn't be wintering bees here. You know, they wouldn't have enough food. They'd be starving uh, to overwinter, like this, the size of those colonies. They obviously don't need that much honey, but they need a good 100 pounds uh, to make a winter. Now, if you're greedy, that's a lot of money. <laughs> You know, you're, you're, you're saving yourself $500 a colony, you know, to keep it alive, you know, is what that comes to. Wow. Yeah. Do they still do the billows smoking and? I have that on the back of my truck right now. You okay. know, the, it's, it's, <coughs> it's a smoker, a couple of hive tools. It's just very basics. I have a couple of extra tools in there um, for extracting uh, different larva, you know, when I'm suspicious of something or seeing how the health is. Um, any more, if it's a sticky point, I'd rather have the onus on the laboratory instead of hating Jeff. They can hate the lab, you know. So I send it away in about two weeks, I get a return. Because I work real closely with ODA lab and our state entomologist. Uh, she's hard to get a hold of, but once in a while we talk. Okay. And it's mainly the problem cases, right? Mm -hmm. Right. And um, so we haven't had any real bad outbreaks down here like uh, European or American foul birds. So I'm interested to see what what results that will be coming back. Um, we've had it in other surrounding counties. Um, and so I think basically it's m small high beetle management here is what it is. Because I get uh, very receptive people here in this county. You know, you know, so Because mm. they want to they be successful. Absolutely. But it's like a game of baseball. It's a game of failures. You know, it's... It's not an easy game. It's not going to be a year or two. It's an art. It's going to take you 10 years or something, yeah, anymore. Because I gifted a hive a couple of years ago. It's no longer in existence, and so they're out of business. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, you have to have a, you got to have some thick skin, you know, sometimes. Okay. Well, thanks for being awesome. with us today. Thanks for the update. Thanks, folks.